First John chapter 4. As you make your way there, we'll return to the Lord once again in prayer. Dear God, we come to you tonight. We're so thankful for the many blessings that you've given us, for allowing us, allowing us yet another opportunity to gather together. I pray that as we gather, that we do so uh, considering the purpose in which we gather, considering the hope that we have in the resurrection of Christ and the, and the, and the promised uh, resurrection that we'll receive and, and of the future hope and of the inheritance that, that, that we have to, to wait on. And God, we're just so thankful that not only that you've given us such wonderful things, but you've written us of them in your word, uh, that you've instructed us the, the reasons that we have hope. Uh, that you have given us all that, that we could possibly need, and then you've equipped us with the Holy Spirit that we could seek that word that you've written to us, to interpret it, to grow in it, and to uh, begin to, to resonate with it on, on a spiritual level, not just an intellectual one. You know, we're so grateful for that. Please help me as I would stand, that I would do uh, that which is pleasing in your sight, that it be led of the Spirit and not of myself, be, be led of the Holy Spirit, uh, that, that, that I would not try to place my own thoughts or interject my, my own opinions into the matter but that the truths of your scripture would be clearly presented, clearly taught clearly clearly brought forth in spite of my many imperfections please help those that would be here and lost that they would see a need to trust you that they could understand their lost condition that they could see clearly that they have no genuine faith and that they are in desperate need of, of a savior that, that, that they're, the, the condition that they find themselves in is just awful uh, that there's really no other way to put it that, that it, is, it, it is a dire circumstance that they currently stand in, uh, and that there is a Savior that stands ready to save them, that they no longer have to be in such a circumstance, that there's nothing that they are waiting on, uh, but that they could simply trust in the work that you've done, and that you've written to them of, that, that, that it's just clearly presented the gospel message, and it's such a plain and, and simple truth. God, we thank you for making it so, and that it would be available to all. We ask these things in your wonderful holy name, you're so worthy. Amen. 1 John chapter 4, begin reading here in verse 1. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. You're of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now, reading down through verse 6, the, uh, the intent for tonight is only to cover the first three verses, but really this presents one idea that John is getting across, and this idea stems from that which he transitioned to in chapter 3. Uh, you recall in chapter 3, we're talking about assuring our hearts before him and having that assurance of the Spirit. And then he'd say in the last verse of chapter 3, And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit, which he had given us. But then in chapter 4, that he takes the time to explain uh, that there is more than one type of Spirit. That there, is, that, that there is the Holy Spirit, and there is the Holy Spirit that moves in, in, in accordance to his word. There's the Holy Spirit, sin of God, promised of Christ. You can go read of that in, in, uh, in the book of John. That, that Multiple different times he assures them that he does not leave them without a comforter. He is not leaving them blind, but that he will send the Spirit of truth unto them. And it is the Spirit of truth. There is an objective nature to that Spirit that... There is this increasingly popular, I say increasingly popular, I guess that's not true, it's been around from the beginning, but this unfortunately very popular idea in which that, they, that people would just try to present the spirit as just this very mystical thing, uh, this thing that there is just no comprehension of. And, and that is actually a, much of, of the heresy that, that, from what it seems, that John is combating in the book of First John, that, that early heresy that we talked about many, many, many weeks ago of Gnosticism, that it kind of presents God and, and, and as this uh, as only spirit, and that which is just really unknowable, that which is just beyond man. And, and while God is above man, and while God does things that is, is impossible for us to comprehend, not having the whole picture, as we talked about, he's still bound by his word. He's bound by his promise and by his nature, that he has an infinite nature. But he has it within a certain 
a set of boundaries that he has set forth for himself. That this spirit, that it, it, is, it is one spirit, it acts in the same way. It would not make sense for the same exact spirit that is in me of God to act different from the spirit of God that is in you. It's the same spirit. It extends from the same God with the same nature, bound by the same rules that he has set for himself by his character. And so that there, with this spirit, that there is a need to, as he would say, test the spirits. He says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. That it is very easy to get caught up in spirits that are not of God. Just because, that, that actually, as, as you read through God's word, if by, by my memory, the first occurrence takes place in the book of Deuteronomy, and, and it may take place sooner than that, that God's people are warned of false prophets. And they're given a, a set of how that they can test prophecy. They're, they're told of what to watch out for. Because it was very necessary, and it, it, it is something that we see in the book of Deuteronomy, and it extends all the way to the Old Testament. You recall the book of Jeremiah, that there were those in Jeremiah's day that were prophesying, no, no, all is well, everything's okay. Uh, as we'll come in the book of Nehemiah to a point, even that would take place after the book of Jeremiah, that in the book of Nehemiah, that there would be those that were hired to go into to, amongst Judah in Jerusalem to falsely prophesy the downfall of Nehemiah. But there's always been this, this concern, there's always been this issue, and it's even in, in the New Testament that there, he says that there are, he says because many false prophets are gone out into the world. This is not some sort of hypothetical warning. It's not just something that, hey, this, this, this may happen, but rather something that was already happening, and it was happening in great abundance. He says that many are gone out. There are many false prophets, many that teach incorrectly. And so that's why in many of the epistles, we have a warning to watch out for these things. And looking back at this, I love that it's tied in with this idea of trying the spirits and testing the spirits, that, uh, that there is this movement and, and that it is, a, it is a rejection of religion in the pursuit of spirituality. And it's, it's painted in a, in a positive way. And many times it, it, it sounds right. That there are those that, well, I know I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. Well, are we supposed to be spiritual? Sure we are. We're supposed to be spiritual, but we've got to be careful what spirit we're of. But religion is not a bad thing. The book of James speaks of true religion. This is what true religion, are there false religions? Sure there's false religions. But to abandon this idea, and, and where it comes from, is there is this, the, the, the old example of the Pharisee, for instance, that is very legalistic and, and makes for themselves rules for self-righteousness. Well, that's not all religion. That's one form of being religious. Right, really what we could call that is having a zeal not according unto knowledge, as God's word would put it. Religion is a good thing. Religion is explained to us in the word of God. It gives us boundaries. Our spirituality has to be bound because the spirit's bound. We talked about that, how that the spirit, while it has unlimited power, unlimited knowledge, and unlimited ability, that it is impossible for the spirit to do some thing. It is impossible for the spirit of God to lie. It is impossible for God to do that which is unrighteous. It is bound, and so the Holy Spirit, too, is bound. It's bound by religion. It's, it, that, that's really why we have the text of Scripture. It binds us. It holds us to forsake religion. And with this idea, well, no, I, I'm not religious. I'm just going to be more spiritual. Well, spiritual has a, it, it's much more one size fits all. But there's many, 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 many ways that you could go out and be spiritual. There's only one way to be religious according to God's word. I do want to point that out because there are other religious steps that you could follow. Don't follow those. There's one way to be religious and spiritual at the same time according to God's word that he has written to us because it is only according to his word. His word doesn't mean different things. His word means what it means. And so we're bound to that. We must be very careful. We must be very careful to cast off these boundaries that God has set. This is not a good thing to do. It is good to be bound in our spirituality. It is good to have rules. Rules are important. Rules are such a beautiful thing. Praise God that he's given us rules. You can look back to when, when you were a child. If you had things your way, that you would have no rules. And as a child, you would have eaten Snickers bar for, for every single meal. And by the time you got about 10 years old, you'd have no teeth and you'd be just incredibly obese and just have all of these issues 
uh, that, that, that you, would, you would encounter constant problem after problem. Thank God you had some rules for yourself that, that whenever you didn't know any better, you had some rules in place. That no, you can't have a Snickers bar for every single meal. You've got to eat real food. You've you got to eat your vegetables. You've got to eat your fruit. You've got to eat these other things. And this, this is good for you to do. But there are rules. Hey, don't go, don't go play in the street. Well, as a kid, what does it matter? There's, there's no boundaries. I just run wherever I want to run. Well, no, you don't run over there. There's a reason for that. It, it kept you safe. And God has given us rules within our spirituality to that way I can test what spirit I am following, what spirit is leading me, because I can be led astray very easily. God's word stands as his word. It's concrete. It is exactly as, it, as he has given it to us. And so to forsake religion, to pursue spirituality, this is not as good as it sounds. And don't, and please don't mistake me that, that I have been among those crowds where, no, I'm not religious, I'm, I'm spiritual. I, I've fallen into, into that phrase. I've used that phrase. I regrettably use that phrase, but I've used it not, not really thinking of it, not knowing any better, and I meant well by it. Just be, and I, I give this disclaimer because just because you, you may have used that, that phrase, I understand. I've used it plenty of times. But religion in and of itself is not a bad thing. As a matter of fact, it's a good thing. It's how, we, it's how God has instructed us to follow him. It's not our own rules to follow him. It's God's instruction in us following him. And so our worship is outlined and structured by God, and that is who we must seek. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 8. Isaiah, chapter 8. Is outlined very well here, kind of explained in a very convicting fashion for usual for Isaiah, for usual for the Word of God. Isaiah chapter eight verse nineteen it says, "And when they shall, it says, and, and when they shall say unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God, to the living, to the dead?" And we'll continue to read in just a moment, but. That there is this this thing taking place in which there's some some unknowns, there, there's some problems, and so that there are those, especially those within pagan religions, seek those that have a familiar spirit, those that are uh, fortune tellers, those that, that do all sorts of all manner of witchcraft, really. To, to that's why he speaks of the wizards that peep and that mutter, that try to look into the future, that uh, that, that use these these familiar spirits or, or demonic spirits. And, and so this is how that, that they make their means. This is how that they would see into the future. And as you look, even in, in throughout God's word, that uh, they've done so successfully from time to time. Uh, this is a very real thing. And so that they're seeking th these spirits. And they're given this question, should not a people seek unto their God? So that's the alternative. Well, why would we seek the spirits when we can seek God? Well, how do I speak God? God is, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. God's word is, must be spiritually discerned. You're, you're correct. But how do I know that the spirit that, that I'm following is the spirit of God and not the false spirits, not the ungodly spirits? Well, he says so in, in verse 20. Is whenever he would ask, should not a people seek unto their God? He says in verse 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Well, that sounds a whole lot like what John's saying. Sounds a whole, lot, a whole lot like what John's been saying for the entire letter that we've been reading. So that they, that very clearly, that if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. It says, and they shall pass through it, hardly bestead and hungry. And it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward. And what state do they find themselves in? Well, it says in verse 22, And they shall look unto the earth, and behold trouble, and darkness, and dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. This is the result of following those other spirits. Should not the people seek unto their God, to the law, and the testimony, and the commandments that he has given to us? This is what I'm bound by. These are the rules of religion. Don't cast them off. That's what protects us. That's what keeps us safe. And these ungodly spirits don't don't think that they're just so easy to, to spot. 
Whenever I, I make the statement of the, the ungodly spirits, that your mind probably goes to what Hollywood is depicted as the evil spirits. And I, I think Brother Danny, as he talks about those paranormal shows and, and getting the, the, the heebie-jeebies seeing them, and certainly the evil spirits too. That's not the only way that they manifest themselves. The evil spirits, they're, they're very alluring. They're very tempting. As a matter of fact, in the book of James, that's how he just describes the temptation that we were talking about in Sunday school. That God does not tempt us, but we are tempted when we're drawn away of our own lust, that the evil spirits, that they are so attractive and so alluring that I naturally want to follow after that. I naturally want to go seize those things. These are the ungodly, look at the, the ungodly temptation of Satan to Eve in the garden. He, he didn't present himself by... Some of y'all don't like snakes to understand, but he didn't he didn't come to her all head spun around and, and walking weird and deformed. And he didn't come muttering some weird thing in some language he didn't understand, but, but came to her and reasoned with her and spoke of how that she could have wisdom and become as the gods. And this was this was alluring her. This is something that seemed good from to, to her. Now this is how the, these spirits present themselves as things that, that seem good, well-intentioned things. That would draw us away from the Spirit of God to these more ungodly spirits. So thankfully, written in the book of John as a standard to try the spirits, to test them, and to not be so easily drawn away by them. And where we've read tonight, we have one statement that he's given. It's not the only statement. We'll worry about the rest of this at another time. But in verse 2, that he would say, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Here, here's how we know. And in this thing, it's one statement. To confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. That the spirit that does that is of God. And so we have to look at because this proclaims two things about Christ. It proclaims, one, his deity, but it also proclaims his humanity. And if you notice that from a very broad, general perspective, that the spirit of God declares the truths of God's word. And so John zooms in to one particular part of it, that, 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 that the spirit that is of God, it confesses. And this word confess, it is not just to, to say. It's not just a verbal confession. It's not that thing uh, for we think of, uh, when we think of confession, that, uh, that maybe you think back to when you're a kid and, and your mom or your daddy was just getting on you, getting on you, getting on you. And you I know, fine, I understand. It's just, I'm just ready to get this over with. Just, just, just confessing this and, and just moving on. I, I'll take my punishment. I, I understand I'm wrong. Can we just please move on with it? This isn't the confession that it's speaking of. It is an inward, it is a, an outward, rather, confession of that which is taking place inward. I'm expressing my inward condition in which I am expressing my faith in this statement and the faith in what this statement means. To begin with, the deity of Christ. That, that, that we see this because he says every spirit that confesseth that not just Jesus has come in the flesh, not Jesus of Nazareth, but Jesus Christ. Christ wasn't the family last name. Jesus wasn't born of Joseph and Mary Christ. Now this is a title that he possessed. That Jesus possessed this title. Christ. The word Christ it means anointed one. Anointed of who? Anointed of God. Anointed for what purpose? To be the deliverer. The Messiah that the Jews were looking forward to. That they were, were waiting on. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Again, getting y'all to flip back and forth with some of y'all working on them Bible drills. Isaiah chapter 9. To confess that, that he is Christ is to confess that he is the Messiah, the anointed one of God, the Savior of the world. Here in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. We'll read down to verse 7. Decent bit of reading. I encourage you to follow along. It says, Nevertheless, this is right after, actually, where we just read, when it speaks of those that follow after the familiar spirits and the wizards, and they that peep and mutter, and that they shall be driven to darkness, is how verse 22 leaves off. But in verse 1 of chapter 9, it says, Nevertheless, the dimness 
shall not be so shall not be such as was in her vexation when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shone. Thou hast multiplied the nation, and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff off his shoulder, the rod of his oppressors in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warriors with confused noise, and the garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. And so it speaks of this, that, that there is that dimness, but it says that, that there are these in this shadow of death. That there are those that walk in this darkness, that, and a light shines upon them, and they see this light. And upon seeing this light, that it, it explains that the yoke of the burden is broken off of them. It is, in fact, burned away with fuel of fire. How does this take place? What is this light? Verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, and to establish it with judgment, with justice, from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. That there is this light that shines and that, that, that melts away the burden, that gives hope, that gives light, that gives direction, because a child is born. This is the purpose of that anointed one. And if we, we read this, we read these as Christmas verses. A very small percentage of this is, is a Christmas verse. That unto us a child was born and a son was given. And, and it speaks of the government being upon his shoulder. His name be Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. This is the title given to that anointed one. The anointed one is God. That he is the everlasting father and the prince of peace. That wonderful and counts these, these beautiful titles are placed upon the anointed one's name. That the Messiah, the Christ, he is God. It, it expresses his deity. Uh, and so that him being God, his, his purpose is to come and to give light to the world. That's what it describes over in the book of John. That, 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 that the light was, get, I, I, I'm going to butcher the quoting, by the way, but you can go over and read in John chapter 1 and in John chapter 3 and, and read it for yourself in all the many ways that I've messed up. But more or less that it would explain how that, that this light had shined unto men. And there, there were some that loved darkness rather than light, but that, that light, it, it worked effectually for others. That this light that has been given to us, it is this light that has shown us the error of our ways. It is this light that God has, himself has come to earth to show us righteousness and to show us holiness and to show us the standard and to be our Savior, God himself, to redeem his people. Christ is, that, that, and so to confess this, to confess that this anointed one has this position to confess the deity of Christ, that bears implication. That causes movement. It causes action. It causes reform within me. To acknowledge and to confess is not just an intellectual agreement. It's not just saying, yes, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is God in the flesh. It's not just saying, yes, Jesus is God, but that it's not the same that, that we would all intellectually agree that, that the pew you're sitting on is red. I, I know that the pew you're sitting on is red. We can all say, yes, the pew is red. The pew being red bears no implication on me. It doesn't change anything within me. That, that Just any old body can say, oh, yes, I, I agree that the, the pew is red. But the, the confession that it speaks of, of the, the confession that Jesus is the Christ, it causes something within me to happen. God has put us in a position in which we have to respond to him. Every person that, walk, that has ever been born on this planet that has any sort of mental wherewithal, uh, I understand it would be an exception to some, and some, some children that, that died early, and, and all those things, I understand. But, but speaking generally, that mankind has, is in a position that, in which they have got to respond to God. 
He's, he gives us an offer. He puts us at a crossroads, and we have to pick one. He explained this actually in the book of Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Second time, we'll, we'll, no, we're just going to start in verse 22. Sorry, I was trying to save a little bit of time. Not possible. Verse 22. So then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, that he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. We'll continue to read, but to, to capture what has taken place, very famous address and sermon of Paul at Morris Hill, in which he is speaking to these that, that intellectually, for, for, for Paul to come and, ex, and explain that, that there is a God that this altar refers to. They would all intellectually confess that to be probable. That's why they built the altar. They built the altar because they said, hey, there's probably a God out there that we're not aware of. We admit we're men. We have limited knowledge. And we'll build this altar that they might, and he might even have, that he may have given him the story of Jesus. That he could have come and, and given them this account. Well, there was this virgin woman who gave birth to a son. and They, his, they, they named him Jesus. He was born in Bethlehem. And that he grew up in, in Nazareth. And he could give the whole account of all that has taken place, of all that this God was and all that this God has done. That he's come to earth and, and all of these things. And it wouldn't sound weird to them. They've got far weirder stories. It would be a very believable account. It would be something they could all intellectually, they could say, okay, I agree to that. That man, Jesus, he's God. But it's not enough to just intellectually agree but rather that we must respond to this truth. And that is what he is getting at. That he is telling them that they must seek the Lord while he may be found. He would, he would go on to say in verse 29, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men, everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in the which he would judge all the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that he had raised him from the dead this was the conundrum herein lies the problem it was not enough to intellectually agree that Jesus was the Christ they, I doubt that they would have had any problems with this but that they must respond to it. That God has come. He says, in the time of your ignorance, God has winked that. But now he commands that all men everywhere repent. Turn to him. That he's the one true God. He's the only God. Jesus being the Christ, it bears implication. Because if he is who he says he is, then he's going to come do that which he promised to do. What he explained in verse 31, he's appointed a day in which he would judge the world in righteousness according to that man who he's ordained, who he's appointed, anointed, been set aside for the purpose of, according to Christ, and according to Christ's righteousness, that God is coming to judge the world and to measure our righteousness to his righteousness, and there's only one way to pass, and that is to have his righteousness. There's only one way to have his righteousness, to have his righteousness. That it is only obtained by faith that he will give me his righteousness, that I have to respond to the truth that Jesus is the Christ. 
Because that being true bears implication. If he is the Christ, he's coming back. If he is the Christ, this world is going to be judged, and I need to get my soul's salvation settled. It causes me to do something about it. That's why if Christ is who he says he is, it would do us well to heed the advice of Psalm 2, to kiss the sun, lest he be angry. His wrath is kindled but a little. It describes there in Psalm 2 how there are those that want to cast off those bounds. Some of the same bounds we were talking about earlier. I don't want to be religious. I don't want to be bound by these rules. I want to just be more spiritual. I want to just follow my feelings wherever they might take me and be spiritual however I feel that I need to be spiritual. That's not a spirit of God because the spirit of God leads you to Christ. It leads you to his deity. And his deity means something. It means that he is the one God coming in judgment and in wrath, but he's also the God who extends mercy and grace. It means something. And so in Psalm 2, as I said, it describes those that want to cast off those bounds, that don't want to be bound, those bands that don't want to be bound to God. And it says that God will laugh. He will not have it that way. There will be no excuse whenever they stand, whenever someone stands before God in judgment, they say, well, I just didn't want to be religious. I wanted to be spiritual. Well, how did you exercise that spirituality? Because, again, there are some that, that make that statement, and, and really that, to a degree, it's just semantics. We're saying the same thing. But, but, there, there, so, but, but there are those that well, they won't see the truths of Scripture because that's antiquated. It's old. It doesn't hold true anymore. And so they seek their own spirituality because they don't like what this Word of God has to say. And as they stand before God in judgment, God's not going to say, well, I understand we're born in a different culture and things kind of moved on and, and mankind, the, the, the philosophy has shifted and, and blah, 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 blah. No, God doesn't do that. God's word wasn't popular when it was given. That's why folks were being killed over it. God's word has never been popular. That's why he called his people out of a pagan land and gave them a bunch of rules that were against pagan practices. It's never been popular. It's never been the culture. It's always been counterculture. It has always been righteousness amongst wicked men. And so those excuses don't work. That I must respond, I must kiss the Son, must trust in Christ, come to Him, and place my faith in Him to save me. I must, as He described, all men everywhere must do, repent and turn to Him. It causes me to move. But there's another part of this that He, it says that Jesus Christ, in verse 2 of 1 John chapter 4, that we must confess that every spirit that is the Spirit of God. It must confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. There's the other part. He's not just God. It's equally important that we confess that he's man. See, for God to not be, for Jesus to not be God, well, that means that he's not righteous enough or powerful enough to save me. If he's just another man, well, then I have no, I can't put hope in him. Because he has no ability to save me. But if he's not, so that, that's the, the problem with if he's not actually God. Thankfully, he's God. But if, if, if he was just God and not man, well, then whatever he did wouldn't matter for me because he couldn't be my substitute. It's, it's not an acceptable sacrifice anymore. That the, the point of, of him uh, being fully God and fully man, it sort of describes in Matthew chapter 1. Where, actually, I'm going to turn and read it. The point of him coming in the flesh is to be a suitable sacrifice to take my place. Matthew chapter 1. For those keeping track of the references to Isaiah, Matthew chapter 1 is a fulfillment of a prophecy given in Isaiah, I think chapter 14. You can add that to your list. Matthew chapter 1. Verse 20, Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. It says, Well, while he thought on these things, this is Joseph, uh, while he thought on these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take, un to, to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now this was done, 
that it might be fulfilled which is spoken of by the Lord of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. That is such an important piece to the puzzle. It is so if God, if Jesus Christ was all God and no man, that does mean no good. He came to save his people from their sins. He came to be God with us as one of us. That he could go and, and hang on a cross. That he could go. God's wrath had to be poured out on mankind. It was us who brought sin into the world. He had to be that second Adam. And the, with the, in the likeness of Adam, with the, the weaknesses of Adam, and the frailties of Adam, and, and, and all of these things, that, that he had to take that on, and he did it perfectly. That, that he became Adam, the second Adam, but he did it right. He did it without sin. He did it in perfect righteousness. And so therefore, as God's wrath was poured out on the one who didn't deserve it, who willingly took my place, well, then now I have an acceptable sacrifice. He had to bear my infirmities. That's why in Hebrews chapter 4, it speaks of that great high priest. That one who, it, 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 he's not one who's not touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Because he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He's the acceptable sacrifice. And to be an acceptable sacrifice, he had to be man. To be powerful enough to save us, he had to be God. And so we see the two are married together. They combine with great importance. And the, the, the spirit that confesses these things to be true is the spirit as of God. And so he talked about God and his deity. That bears implication for me. That means something. I need to respond to that. But God being man also bears implication. Because for God to be man and for me to confess that inward confession of my inward condition not just intellectually agreeing, but for me to confess that God is man is for me to confess that God had to become man to save me. That, that something had to be done. It is a confession of my own wickedness. I have to have one of my own. I have to have that second Adam to come and to bring me life because all the first Adam brought me was death. And all that I can bring is death. All that works in me is death. All that works in me is wickedness. That I am yet in my sins. That I am dead in my trespasses and sins. And so I must declare my wickedness. And I am declaring my wickedness. And whenever I confess that God had to become man to step into my place. And so for the wrath that was reserved for me. So that I didn't have to. To confess that he is God carries implica implications. It causes me, it causes me to respond. But also to confess his humanity causes me to respond. I need one like me yet better to step into my place to take the wrath I deserve. And so he describes then, the spirit that confesses this is of God. The spirit that confesses that truth that we see all of Scripture pointing to. Remember, as we look to the pages of Scripture, it all declared Christ. They all point to him. And so to, to look to the center of what Scripture revolves around and to make these confessions, that is the Spirit, that is of God. And so for the Spirit, now there might be one who, following their spirituality, they say, oh, I believe that he's fully God and fully man. But that bears no implication on their life. That they may think, well, you know, sin's no big deal. Or my sin, it is... I like to think I'm a generally good person, or maybe they desire right to declare that they have no sin. Well, that's not to confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. And then to just look to Christ as though that he's no God at all. Look to Christ as though that he's just man, and act as though that he isn't God. To, to, to conduct your life in a manner in which that, and, that, and they're acting like he's not God, that there is no judgment coming. That's not to confess that, that there is, there, there's some inconsistencies there. So the words of their mouth, that may not actually match their inward confession of what they're saying. There, there may be some discrepancies. Remember, we're looking at the inward condition. And that is what really ought to, to drive the words that come from our mouth. 
I, uh, that I live my life the way I do and I say the things that I say because I believe this to be true, because I believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and that bears implications on my life. And the spirit that doesn't confess that is not of God. It says, and this is that spirit of antichrist. I want, we spent some time talking about the Antichrist already in the study, and I won't rehash a lot of that. Whenever we do that Antichrist, we, we think of the Antichrist, the big one from the book of Revelation. And while that is the Antichrist, the man of sin, whatever you want to call him, and that there are some specific things going on there, he, he lets us know, that's not the one I'm talking about. He says, where have you heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world? And this was a long time ago. It's still in the world. It is in the world because it is literally anti-Christ. It is against him. And so we must be very careful to test and to try the spirit to see whether they be of God. This be the message. We'll offer verses and questions.